And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Have you ever noticed how dark it can get at night? You know, I remember as a kid, sometimes I couldn't sleep good and just had insomnia, I suppose. And I'd stay up awake all night long. And then early in the morning, the bright light would come out and the rays of sunshine. And, well, you just sort of felt like a new person. There's a great difference between the light and darkness. Sometimes darkness just makes you feel bad. I I don't really like to drive my car at night. Some people do, I suppose, but I don't like to go out at night. You know, you just can't see as much and you don't feel as good. And and they say that a certain amount of sunshine is needed for people to live. Vitamin D, you know. Now the doctors have found that vitamin D is a very essential vitamin. And I'll tell you, it's a cancer fighter. And if you don't have a, you know, so many uh, units of vitamin D in your system, well, you're going to get cancer and all kinds of things. You need to keep plenty of vitamin D in your system. But more than that, you need light. You need light. That's amazing to me how beneficial light is for mankind. You know, it says in the Bible that God gave us the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon. And he established that each one would do a certain job for us. (laughs) God does that the whole universe, of course. And and he he makes the tide come in, the tide go out and and all. And, you know, the, the strongest man in the world can't keep the tide from coming in and going out, can he? I don't think these geoengineers that are talking about global warming and climate change, they can't stop the tide. And and it just seems that God has certain things in this world that we cannot avoid. That's why I laugh at these uh, climate change hoaxers. That's what they are. They've gone to Paris recently and met there, all these nations of the world, and now they've got a system where they're going to make us – they think, pay so much more for gasoline and gas and so forth to save Mother Earth. It's just sort of crazy because the Bible makes clear that we're going to have, you know, the seasons are going to be here. You're going to go through every season, and every day there's going to be a night and a day. That is, unless you're in a that small area of the world where it just stays you know, dark six months of the year or something. But a lot of people can't take that kind of nonsense. They just have to have light. You know, light is important. And the Bible talks again and again about light. And Jesus actually stated, I am the light of this world. It must be very important that we receive that light. And, of course, Satan is the darkness. You know, a Gallup poll just recently showed that many people believe that, well, America's best is over. They believe we're in going into sort of an age of darkness. And they fear, feel very dull, you know, dreary about it. Well, you know, in Matthew uh, and in Isaiah, we read about the light. Isaiah 9 verse 2 says, This is actually a prophecy of Jesus. Now think about that. A prophecy of Jesus. It says the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Now think about that. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And they that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, 
upon them as the light shined. It's interesting that most of the Jews rejected Jesus, yet they were in darkness. When the light came, well, it was too much for them. They rejected the light. They rejected what could save them. But yet the light did shine on them, and God, God made it possible for them to be saved. He even say, said, said that he would save a, a small group. He called them the, the elect. The elect. Most of the people, of course, would reject the light. But those that do not reject the light, he said, well, I'm going to save you, whether you're Jew or Gentile. Now, the darkness has always been a pagan tradition, and it seems that the pagan religions and the religions of, well, say, Judaism today, Hinduism, Islam, seem to favor darkness. And it seems that, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about the New Age movement, which is basically, I have discovered, is a Judaic movement. It's Judaic. And all of the New Age cults and false religions were sponsored and begun and continue on because of their Jewish connection. Now, the yin and the yang is a combination of light and darkness. This is always taught in the satanic religions that God is both light and darkness. But Jesus said that Satan is darkness and that there was none of Satan in him. So there's no darkness at all in Jesus Christ. There's only light. And of course, the prophecy of Jesus came true. And Israel today, those Jews that are perceptive, that are true Jews, well, they know the light did shine. And it's interesting to me, the, the fact that the followers of darkness are many, but they, they, they don't like the, the light at all. And, you know, Job said of his contemporaries, he said, you can read about this in Job 5.14, they met with darkness in the daytime. Well, you know, the Church of Satan was founded by Anton LaVey, Anton Zandor LaVey, a Jew. And he always said, we have our mass, our black mass at midnight. Always at midnight. They say that a person who's a Satanist somehow, somehow is led to be married at midnight. Did you know that? I was recent, recently reading about a, a wedding. I happened to know the man, not intimately, of course, but I'd heard that he was a Satan worshiper. Then I read my local paper, and it said that he was going to get married. Had a picture of he and his lovely new wife, you know, uh, holding hands and, you know, and in, in, in their nice outfits. And they were going to get married on a certain uh, midnight, on a new moon even. That was interesting to me. And I knew right away it was because the man was a Satanist. He wanted to get married during the nighttime. That seemed to have a significance for him. The darkness of evil was everywhere. And people were at their lowest depths of despair in the days of Job. Morale was at its lowest ebb. Spiritual light was gone. Hmm. You know, it's interesting that Jesus did not come with mighty horses and wagons and being uh, pulled by uh, servants and he didn't come with all that pomp and circumstance. He didn't come as one of the royalty, although he was a royal child. When the Roman centurion rode in, everybody heard him. He, he the clatter of horses, steel helmets, swords and chariots. But the whole, the, the light gear of the whole world was a lot quieter. He wasn't really announced with a lot of fanfare, was he? Well, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, 
but shall have the light of life. Do you know Jesus Christ? Then it's an amazing thing, but you're going to be walking. You do walk in light. And the purpose of the light is basically to keep you healthy. It does have vitamin D, but it must have a lot of other materials in it that we don't know anything about. It gives man a knowledge of God and gives us a purpose for living, the light. And, you know, Jesus' message was full of light. And those who worshipped him, they also were full of light. Are you full of light, my friend? Do you feel there's darkness in your life? How do you feel about light and darkness? They say that Satanists and people in these horrible false religions even love to wear dark. If you notice the Catholic Pope, he, he wears a lot of dark outfits, and so do his priest. The Jewish rabbis seem to love the darkness as well. Well, Jesus, think about the Beatitudes. Here is a man, you go to hear him preach, and what does he say? Happy are the poor in spirit. Well, the, the poor in spirit are not always happy, are they? They don't feel like it. Go out to Appalachia or go to West Virginia or go to some of the poor places in this this country. Certainly go overseas and see the poor. Ask them if they're happy in spirit. But Jesus said, happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are they that mourn. Well, I've mourned some in my life, and I don't know if I was happy or not. But Jesus said, happy are they that mourn. Happy are the meek. Well, we, we, we compliment a lot of people on the fact that they're so strong, so strident. But Jesus said, happy are the meek. Happy are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Have you ever been hungry and did you thirst after righteousness? That's a different kind of hunger and thirst, isn't it? You're happy when you're doing that. You know, the happiest people I've seen in the world are the ones that read the Bible and study it, and, and then they want to come and tell me about it. <laughs> hey, have you ever read this part right here in the Bible text? <laughs> yeah, they're happy. They're happy to find some new discovery in the Bible. You know, I read the same book again and again, and I keep finding new nuggets in there of wisdom. Sometimes I tell my wife about them. You know, I've never seen this in the Bible before. Well, I probably read that verse 20 times, but, you know, it it, <laughs> I, it says in the Bible, the Holy Spirit will teach you. You don't even need a man to teach you. The Holy Spirit will instruct you in all things. I believe as you're reading that Bible, the Holy Spirit is going to be instructing you. You may not be ready for that knowledge. You may read it, and it goes right over your head. Then you read it again, and he says, now, you know, he very quietly says to your heart, now, look at this part here. See here? You go, oh, that changes everything. <laughs> Jesus said, happy are the merciful. They say that the happiest people are the ones that do stuff for, do things for other people. They're merciful. They care. They love. They're happy. Happy are the pure in heart. Do you really think the debauched, the depraved person is happy? I don't think so. I think these people that make these porno movies, I think they're very miserable. Oh, they may go to some orgy and, you know, and, and drink and, and clown around and say, oh, yeah, we're having a ball. We're happy. I, I don't think so. Well, what about that? I love think of all these things. Happy, 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 happy. <laughs> if you have the light of Jesus, you're happy. Think about that, folks. People ask me, how can I be happy? And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly counseling people who don't have Jesus. Oh, I don't know. My husband is this. My husband is that. My wife does this. My wife does that. My kids are so, you know, oh, 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 and they go on and on. They whine, whine, whine. 
They're just not happy. I know what their problem is. They need Jesus Christ. And then when they have Jesus, if they're the light of the world, and and they will be because he's the light of the world, and we're just like him if we know Jesus. And if you have the light within you, they're going to come after you. They're going to want what you have. Have you ever had a person come to you and say, you know why I became a Christian? Was it because of you? The light that was in you? What you had, I wanted. I wanted to be like you. You know, they'll say that to you if you're a Christian. Even if you're the weakest person, the poorest person, you don't have nice clothes, you don't drive around in a big car, you don't live in a fancy neighborhood, but somehow or other people will be drawn to you. I've seen that throughout my life. I remember feeling that way. I remember seeing people. They weren't the most popular in school, but they had something. They call it it now, but the it people don't really have it. (laughs) The Christians in my high school had it. They were happy. And I said, well, I'd like to be like that too. I'd like to be happy. Now, why did Jesus give this great sermon, the Beatitudes, to all of these people? They sound like the ravings of a maniac today, don't they? We, our, our politicians tell us we cannot be happy because our government is evil. Our government is corrupt. Our government is stupid. Well, sometimes they're stupid by design, but they are. They really are. What's that got to do with being happy? In fact, Paul, the apostle Paul said, in whatever state I find myself, I, 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 I am content. When he was in a jail cell, he wrote to his friends and said, can you, can you bring me a few books? Just bring me a few books so I can read them. And he said, I, I, I'm, I'm content here. How can he be content? Who can be content in a prison? Wasn't it dark there? Wasn't it dank? Wasn't it wet? It's a horrible place. I, they don't have any judges to protect you in, that, in the, those prisons in that day. They didn't bring you the best of food either. You ate their slop and you, you know, you went to sleep on a hard floor and all of that. But he said, I'm happy. How could the man have been happy? Hmm. I remember reading the story in the book Tortured for Christ by Richard Vermbrand. He was a Christian. In fact, he was arrested in Romania, a communist country, because he was a Christian. He happened to be Jewish, too. The the guard said to him, why are you a Christian? You're a Jew. Jews hate Jesus. Don't you hate Jesus? Richard said, no, I love Jesus. You have to understand Jesus. Jesus loves me, too. He loves you. (laughs) Ha! You're here here under our hands. We can do to you whatever we want. We can take you out and beat you right now. We can beat you mercilessly. He said, you can. Yes, you can. I know you can. But I'll still be happy. You know, you can't defeat a man like that. You can beat him out. You can, you can kill, go all the way to killing him. But you still can't take away what he has. Jesus had something. He had purpose in him. He had the purpose that God had given him when he came to earth. God said, you're going to be Messiah. And and you're going to be a great light. And the people that walk, walk in darkness will see your light. And they'll become that light. That's the nice thing, isn't it? You become that light. And that light will reveal to other people that you're a Christian. That's what what really happens. It, it's the, the opposite of reality. See, this is not reality that we're living in. Some people say to me, sometimes I just believe like I'm I'm in a, I'm in a different country. This country is not my home. I think every Christian feels that way. I'm proud to be an American, but America is not really my home. I, I, my home is heavenly Jerusalem. Heaven. 
I know I have all these things here on earth, but when I, when I leave them, I'll have none of them. Every book that I write, I'm proud of. Yes, I'm very proud of it. But I'm going to leave all these books behind too. I'm going to be something greater than what I am now. I don't know what I'm going to be exactly, but I know I will be like Jesus. And everything that I have, all my traditions here on earth and all my earthly wants and desires and goals of, you know, pleasure and with gain and all those things, so puny these things. They're, they're such puny things. I, I was telling Wanda not too long ago, I was happy as a young airman in a dormitory. Had a two-man room. They could come in and inspect it any time they wanted to. Had to be kept, you know, ship shape, as they used to say in the Navy. Of course, I was in the Air Force, but <laughs> I was happy there. I would read my Bible. I would talk to other people about Christ. I, I had other Christian friends, and I was really happy. Wanda said, well, you know, we, we, we're, we're pretty well set now. We've got a house. We've got a nice car, and we've got plenty of food. What would you do if you went back you had to live, let's say, in a, oh, a mobile home or a, a little bitty apartment? I told her I'd be happy. Probably more happy than now. Now I got a yard to mow and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or, you know, got to keep up with the house and all that. It, it seems like, though, that people that have the darkness in their life, they're never happy. And truth is not welcome to these people. That's why they cannot stand when I write a book like pastors and churches going wild. And you know, that's biblical. It, it says in the Bible, everyone that does evil hates the light. Think about that, folks. That's why the government keeps so many secrets. They're evil. That's why they... They say we need the National Security Agency and the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency, and we need to watch everybody all the time. If you're on the, if you're online sending somebody a message, they're probably reading your email. If you're on the telephone for somebody, they're probably listening. Why? Why do they want to hear the darkness? Why are they involved in the darkness? Because they hate the light. Truth is not welcome to them. It, it says. In John 3.20, everyone that does evil hates the light and comes not to the light, lest his works should be reproved. They don't want their dirty works to be known to you and me. They want to keep secrets. And I want to tell you something, my friends. You know, I'd like to write a whole entire book and just say, call it Dirty Secrets. All the secrets of the government for the last 200 years. Well, I couldn't really write a book. That would fill up a whole encyclopedia, wouldn't it? Tony Blair over in Great Britain said recently, I became a Christian when I was in government, but I couldn't tell anybody because the people don't like their leaders to be Christians, so I had to keep quiet till I left the government. Huh? He's not really a Christian then. When you're a Christian, my friend, you can't help but act as a Christian. The light in you will reveal who you are. And I couldn't see that in Tony Blair's life. And I understand it now. He's, well, I was a Christian, but I couldn't tell anybody. When you're a Christian, you cannot not tell anybody. Goodness gracious. You're going to live like a Christian. You're not going to be having these secrets. Jesus said everything that people do in secret they, they, they whisper in the ear in a, in a closet. It's going to be shouted out on the, on the rooftop. So someday some, somebody will shout it on the rooftop. Think about that. You think you got secrets? The day is going to come when everybody's going to know your secrets. You know, if a man or a woman has an affair outside of marriage and you keep it well disguised and concealed and you say, I've got a secret. No, you don't. It'll come forth. It'll be made manifest, the Bible says. Every secret will become known. 
You will be reproved. And you know, it might be at a very bad moment. It might be the moment when you've died and, and, and you stand in front of judgment. And, and perhaps God asks you, why do you deserve to go to heaven? Well, I've done ABC and I'm this and that. And then suddenly he says, I want to reveal the secrets that you've, you've, you've kept hidden all these years. What are you going to say then? All those secrets are revealed. Everyone that does evil hates the light and comes not to the light, lest his work should be reproved. Well, the, the light is more than what you own. It's who you are as a Christian. It's who you are. And, and no one can criticize you because you're full of light. And if they do, they're just, they're just silly people. Jesus said a man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he possesses. You say, I've got a, I've been collecting things over the, the years. I've got, my goodness, my whole house is full of things that I've collected, precious things. Really? Well, it may be nice now, but really, that's not the light of your life. That's not the treasures that God talks about. And people can take those things away. Oh, yes, they can. A revolution can come tomorrow in the United States. You think it, it, it wouldn't. I mean, we've been here for over 200 years fairly safely until just recently, but, but, but all that could be taken away by crime, by revolution. Maybe some other country will invade us, take away our freedoms. But they can't take away your happiness, your real wealth, your faith, your hope, your love. They can't take any of that away. I had a Christian sister that wrote to me and she says, my, my husband left me for a younger woman. I don't have anybody now. I'm all alone. And I wrote her back and said, sister, you're not alone. You have me and Sister Wanda here praying for you. You have us praying for you. And Jesus is with you. He's right there with you. You know, you, you can worship just with Jesus. You can talk to him. He'll, he'll, he'll help you. He wants to help you. And this small valley of despair that you're going through you will be taken out of it eventually. God will take you out of it. You'll be living in the light. Darkness cannot stay in the life of a Christian. It can visit a while, but it won't stay. Even the Antichrist will fall by the light. The Antichrist himself, the man with 666 number, he is going to fall to light. We'll talk about that when we come back in a minute. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The man who opposeth and exalteth himself uh, above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the man of sin, the son of perdition. He'll fall to the light. The light will defeat him. The light that is in you, the hope of glory, will defeat the Antichrist. He cannot overcome you and me. And you don't need to worry about him. He's defeated. It's the light that defeats him. I'll be right back after this brief message. Stay with us, won't you? You're talking to Tex Mars here, and we're talking about how bright the light of Jesus is in your life. Well, my new book, folks, is Pastors and Churches Gone Wild. The subtitle is pretty self-explanatory. It reads, America's Christian Establishment Has Gone Berserk. The Christian Establishment Has Gone Berserk. You know, they've been headed that way for a long time, haven't they? And boy, 
they've made the grade now. People have no respect for churches. They have no respect for Christian leaders. And, and, and I, I think they think that churches are evil. Now, I, w- I cannot imagine. But if you tell a person you're going to church, that's nice, they think. But they don't think that it's anything special because they've seen what the churches are in America. Now, I wrote this book because for years I've been so concerned about the establishment churches. Really, for over 35 years, I've studied the churches. I've gone to a number. And, you know, the things that go on in churches are incredible. I remember going to one church here in Austin, Texas, a Westland church, sort of like Methodist, you know. And I was preaching, and it just suddenly hit my mind to say something about rock music. It wasn't part of my talk. And I mentioned how evil rock music was, some of the things that were going on. And and the young man just jumped right up out of his pew. And he looked at me and just glared at me. And he went right out the door. He went right out the back of the church. And everybody was looking at him. And he slammed the door as he went out. Well, I sort of knew what pulled his or, or punched his button, didn't? can't you imagine? And his mother got up later on at the end of the service and came up and apologized and said, that was my son. He was mad because you were criticizing his kind of music, rock music. Well, she told me that he was involved in Satanism and he was involved in drugs and all kinds of things. He didn't have the light in him. And and he, and he couldn't stand for me to criticize the darkness. Well, this book is about pastors that are just like that young man. I talk about the pastor that claims 666 is a holy number. It's his number, and he requires everybody in his congregation to get a tattoo of 666. You know, people are getting it. They're saying it's wonderful. Our pastor has told us to go out and take the number 666. You say, oh, text, that's impossible. No pastor would do that. This pastor actually says he's Jesus. He's reincarnated, and he's Jesus. And the congregation showers the guy with money. Well, then there's the pastor that says that Red China's communist butcher, Mao Zedong, and Jesus believed exactly alike. Wow. Well, there was one pastor, and I wrote about him in this book. He resigned from the pulpit. He said, I'm fleeing the madhouse. Well, I understood that. He's fleeing the madhouse. He quit the Episcopal Church. He's fleeing the madhouse. And he joined the Catholic Church. He's still in the madhouse. He's still right there, isn't he? Pastors and churches gone wild. It's a big book, over 250 pages, $22. We asked $5 shipping and handling. As for pastors and churches gone wild, not text Mars. Now, to get this book, all you have to do is phone us toll-free, 1-800-234-9673, 1-800-234-9673. As for the book, Pastors and Churches Gone Wild, just came out. It's sort of causing a lot of racket in the world right now, as you can imagine. Or you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com, powerofprophecy.com. Or you can write to us. At Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Pastors and churches gone wild. And now let's return to our regular program. We're just talking about the Antichrist. You know, Second Thessalonians 2, Paul says, Don't be shaken in mind. Don't be troubled. Don't, don't think that the day of Christ is come, that Christ is coming soon until there first come a great falling away. Well, if you read my book, Pastors and Churches Gone Wild, you know that, well, that falling away has come. He says, verse 3, don't let anybody deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away, and that man of sin is re- uh, be revealed, the son of perdition. So, the falling away occurs first, and that leads to the, the son of perdition coming. 
Well, sure, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, would not be believed in a time when people are just flocking to the church and just becoming Christian. During a time of great revival, no, he won't come then. But when people's spirits have fallen, when people have gone into darkness, when they love the darkness more than light, that's when he arrives. It's just perfect for him. Right now, this year, it's perfect. 2016 is perfect. 2017 is perfect. Oh, yes, he's going to come anytime soon. Verse 4 says, He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He's above all of that. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Oh, they've got to rebuild the temple first then. Over there in, in Jerusalem, they've got to rebuild the temple first. No, 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 no. Listen to me, folks. You, if you're a Christ believer, if you're a believer in Christ, you are the temple of God. You're part of it. Yeah. You're, you're one of the living stones, the Bible says. And God is a great builder, and he's built all these stones up. And, and, and it's a great, it's, his creation is fabulous. He's the cornerstone. Imagine, you're perfectly framed. You, I mean, you fit perfectly. If they pulled your stone out, the whole thing would fall. But don't worry about that. Nobody can take away your light. It's a whole temple of light. It's right here on this earth. It's the kingdom of God is right here with us. It's within you. A lot of people don't know that. They say, well, when Jesus returns, then we'll have the kingdom of God. Oh, no, no. Listen to me, friends. When you come to know Jesus Christ, you enter the kingdom of God. It's right with you. That's the glorious thing. <laughs> that's, that's why you are a glorious being. And you worship the most glorious being, the highest. He doesn't have to exalt himself because he's already higher than anything else. He's God. And he sits in the temple of God. In other words, he sits among us. He's with us. We're in his kingdom. I was recently reading a book by a Jewish rabbi. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's a, it's a big secret. It's probably the biggest secret that there is in, in Judaism. And, and many Jews don't know about it themselves. And the highest learned rabbis tell them, don't tell anybody this great secret. But I've discovered the secret, and here it is. It's almost mind-boggling. The Jews believe that they're going to be their own Messiah. But they will be led forward into the light. They claim the light. See, there's a false light. There's a, there's a light that's, that's, that's dark. There's a light that's dark. They're going to be led toward that by the serpent, by Satan. Satan is the God of the Jews. And the top rabbis say the serpent is our guide. He's our helper. He's like medicine. He will lift us into the light, and we shall become God's own earth. We shall become our own Christ. We shall be our own God. Hmm. You see, they're opposing themselves to the temple of God. The temple of God is all the people that Jesus has brought into his kingdom. Every person on earth who has ever died to this life has gone on to be part of this temple of God. And let me tell you something, my friends. In this temple, the light is not the sun. It's not the moon. The light is God and Jesus. The very light of the temple is God and Jesus. That's in the book of Revelation. You see, God will not live in a temple built with human hands. He's not interested in that. The Jews say someday we're going to rebuild our temple. And evangelical Christians, oh, yes, we're going to give them the money. We're going to help them to build their temple. Oh, you're building a temple to the Antichrist, to the devil. Because Jesus builds his heart, his temple, through the hearts of men. He combines all the hearts together, and we all function as one. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a life in Jesus. And you're not going to be happy until 
you ask Jesus to take over your life, and he will lead you. He will guide you into his light. You will be in his kingdom. You will be his temple, and we will all be one with Jesus Christ. Oh, this is a great mystery, my friends. There is a mystery of iniquity, but there is also a mystery of God, of godliness. It says here, for the mystery, this is verse 7 of chapter 2 of Thessalonians, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Who is that wicked? That's the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Whom the Lord shall consume, now listen to this, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Think about that. How's God going to destroy? The Antichrist, the man of sin, who has the devil incarnate within him. He does it with the brightness of his coming. It's done automatically. They don't grapple with swords and knives or tanks and laser aircraft or jets or anything. They don't have nuclear bombs. The brightness of his coming. My friends, you don't want to be opposed to the light when the light comes. When the light comes in its full glory. I remember reading about a scientist who was studying lasers when they were first developed. And, and, and he was told, don't look at the laser light. Don't look in it directly. And he forgot himself for a brief moment and he looked into the laser light and his, his eyes, he suddenly began to, to, to feel the light ebb out. It, it, you see, his eyeballs begin to melt within. And within, within just eight or nine seconds, he was blind, totally blind. And the man he's blind to this day, the light drove him to blindness. Well, it's a little bit like Jesus Christ. When he comes, the devil will wither away. The devil will be killed. The devil, I mean, he, he can't take that light. I say he'll be killed. I actually be thrown into the lake of fire where he'll be Tormented forever and ever, the Bible says. The wicked will be revealed, and the Lord will consume him with the spirit of his mouth. That means whatever God says to him, that does the job. Be gone, Satan. That's probably enough to do him in. Because the light's going to follow. The light is what does Satan in. And the, the, the disciples of Satan on this earth, your light will destroy them. It must have really tormented those guards back in the communist days when Pastor Richard Vermbrandt said, Jesus is my light from that dark cell. Jesus is my light. Oh, they beat him, starved him, did all kind of things to him. But they must have marveled. They must have gone back in, 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 into their rooms late at night, privately laying on their beds, thinking about that man. He was tormenting them. Oh, they had the right to torture him. They could, uh, they could probably kill him, get away with it. But he was tormenting them with his love for Jesus. But of the Antichrist, it said in verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God sent them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. God sends them a strong delusion. You know, it says in the Bible that God actually can send blindness. Now, that's not physical blindness. But some people who reject the light, then he sends blindness to. Then they're in darkness. Their whole life, they'll be, they'll be in darkness. They'll be damned. Now, friends, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ or you reject him right now, the time may come when God says, I'm not going to work with this man anymore. I'm not going to appeal to his conscience I'm not going to ask him to accept me as Lord and Savior anymore. I'm through with him. You never know when that day is going to come. And you may not have another opportunity to serve God. 
This may be your last chance. This this sermon you're listening to today might be it. You don't know. Oh, I'll serve him next week. I'll do that. I'll I want to pleasure in unrighteousness until then. Yeah, well, then might be right now. You know, it says in John chapter three, what a great chapter that is. I, I, I've been reading it several times lately. It says in uh, John three fifteen. you know, the verse, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever la- uh, have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And verse 18 is fantastic. It says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know, a lot of people say to me, who are you to consign people to hell? Well, I'm I'm nobody. There's not one person on earth I've ever consigned to hell. I couldn't send you to hell. I I can't. I have no power to do that. You know, even when I'm mad at somebody, if I were to say go to hell, well, God would lash back at me and say, who are you to say that? Keep your mouth shut, Tex Mars. I'm the one that sends them to hell. But I can tell you what God said. I can tell you the people that go into hell because of these things he said, but he may still want that man in uh, in, in heaven. I may think the man is an utter fraud, a, a terrible person, a jerk. <laughs> Boy, I may think he's a murderer. I may say that guy will not be in heaven when I go. Well, I'm probably going to be wrong. I may be wrong. Jesus already got it. Cho- he's already got you chosen. He's got everybody he wants in his temple, in his light. He has chosen you before the foundation of the world. Now, this is one thing I've mentioned, and people don't understand it. But God doesn't have any time. God doesn't have any periods. He doesn't have any days. He doesn't have any nights. <laughs> It's amazing. But, you know, we talk about Einstein's theory of relativity, that that time is relative. It depends on how fast you're going. I guess the NASCAR drivers, you know, they say, well, I'm going to live a long time then because I drive fast. You have to drive a lot faster than that, my friends. You have to drive faster than the speed of light. Thousands and thousands of miles a, a, a second. But it is an amazing thing, isn't it? That how, I mean, light can affect your, how old you are. And it's interesting that God has already found you. He has designed the world so that you'll be be born into the world. And he's designed the world so that you'll be saved sometime during your life or you'll be damned. Now, people say to me, that's not fair. Before God even saw me, even before I was born as a child, even before I was in the womb, God knew that I was going to be damned forever. Yes, he did. Or before I was ever born in the room, God was going to favor me by saving me and bringing me into the light of his glory. How can that be? Why do I deserve that? I don't know. He does what he wants. Paul Talked about it being like a potter. You know, the pot doesn't tell the potter, why did you make me like this? <laughs> you ever saw a pot? It's, it's ugly. I don't like that pot. It's not, I don't like the shape of it. I don't like the, the structure. I don't like the foundation of it. I don't like the, the way the top, you know, has a little border. I don't like that at all. Well, you can talk about the pot like that, but the pot cannot talk about you like that. You ever heard a pot talking to a man? He doesn't do that. God made you the way you are, and you cannot complain about it. Oh, well, you can, but it's, it won't do you any good. Now, some people go out and sin and say, well, I've, I've already been consigned to hell from the time I was born, so I'm just going to, you know, born to raise hell. You've heard that saying before? That's pretty stupid. They're bringing damnation upon themselves. 
I like better the person that says, I was not born to raise hell. I, I was born to serve God. I'm going to serve God. You know, God already knew which way you're going to go. But you didn't. That's why somebody said, well, why should I go out and preach to anybody? God's already going to save them. He's already got his choices. Why do I have to go preach to them? They'll be saved. Well, <laughs> how are they saved? How's the pot made without a potter? God, God appoints a potter to make the pot. God has chosen you to go tell that other man about him so that he will be chosen. That's so silly, these people, these hyper-Calvinists who say, I don't need to tell anybody about Jesus because if God wants them, he'll call them into his. It's like irresistible. It might be irresistible because God has called you to go and tell them. <laughs> but, but listen to this. In verse 19 of John 3. And this is the, uh, talking about the, those who are condemned. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. Boy, <laughs> here's what's going to condemn you. You're going to be condemned for this purpose. Listen, friends, it's not automatic that you go to hell. You don't know where you're going to go, but listen. And this, if you're going to have this condemnation, this is what happens to you. And this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So your deeds are evil. You love the darkness. You don't want your deeds to be reproved. You don't want somebody to tell you your deeds are evil because you're going to hate that person. That's why people hate the ministry of Tex Mars. I, I, I'm showing them that their deeds are evil. I'm sure the men that I write about and women and pastors and churches going wild, they must hate me. How dare you say these things about me, Tex Mars? They don't want to be condemned. They're only going to be condemned if their deeds are evil. How are people going to know about their deeds? Well, they will know. You can't hide it. Someday it'll come out. It'll be made manifest for everyone. Verse 20 says, for everyone that doeth evil, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be received, uh, reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. If you have the truth in you, my friends, you will thank Jesus for it. You will say, thank you for coming into my life. Let my deeds be made manifest so that all may know that I am yours. It's pretty important, isn't it? Jesus said to his followers, you are the light of the world. Even so, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. You see, that's what your father, God, that's what he deserves. That's what he automatically has as God. When you shine a light as a Christian by doing good, by being good, by serving others, by showing love to others, kindness, consideration, mercy. When, when all these things are true, you're not just glorifying yourself. You're glorifying the Father in heaven. Think about that. You know, think about that. We're, we're, you see, to be obedient in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Think about that. Again, we're in the middle of a, a, a perverse, a crooked generation. So that we may, quote, be seen as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. Wow. We celebrate the light. We are the light. In the midst of a perverse generation. Oh, they'll see you. And they'll hate you. Why do they hate Christians? You know they do. The atheist. The Satanist. The church of Satan. The people in Planned Parenthood. They hate people like you and me. You're hypocritical. You're this. You're that. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're. They hate Christians. Because your life example 
compared to theirs makes their life so rotten, so unrighteous, so miserable. They want to bring you down with them, my friends. They want you to join them in the muck and the mire. There should be a lot of difference between the lives of Christians and non-Christians, but there's none today. There's a guy out there named Barna that does research in the lives of Christians. And he goes out and asks Christians, you know, what are they, what are they living like? He's found that there's as much promiscuity in the Christian community as there is in the non-Christian community. How can that be, folks? Christians seem to like rock music as well as the perverse, crooked world. How can that be, my friends? You're not trusting in God. You're not the light of the world, but we should be. Well, a lot of people fear men. They, they fear not being politically correct. They, they, they move into a new neighborhood. They don't want to tell their neighbors they're Christians because, you know, they'll look down on me. People look down on Christians today. People don't like Christians. What's that to you, dear friend? What's that to Jesus Christ? They crucified him because they didn't like him. His example was so great that they said, "We go away with this man, crucify him." You're not you're you're not going to be crucified, are you? You may go through a little bit of shame, a little bit of contempt. So what? You know, it is a privilege to suffer for sake of the truth. Happy are you when men persecute you. For my name's sake. That's, isn't that amazing? You can be happy when men persecute you as long as they're doing it for the sake of God. Paul said that Christians should become blameless and harmless. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you are seen as lights in the world. Wow. You may not even know what people are saying about you. You walk in the light and people are talking about you. Everybody will know about you. Everybody will say he's he's walking in the light. He's part of the light. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. Proclaim the gospel. Live godly. Practice mercy and charity. Practice love. For our wrestling, the Bible says, is not against flesh and blood but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. That's who your fight is against. It's not against human beings. It's against the rulers of darkness. That's who our enemy is. But let me tell you something, my my friends. Your friend, your great friend, your friend that's already defeated the darkness is Jesus Christ, the light of the world. With him, my friends, <laughs> you're headed for glory. You you can't go wrong. You just put on the whole armor of God. Put on the light. And so I ask you, my friends, to in this little talk today, we've had this little discussion, I guess you could call it. How bright is your light? How, how much do people see Jesus in you? How many watts, you might say, <laughs> of candle power do you have? In your light. Is there any darkness? Then put on the light and be happy. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. My prayer is that you'll tune in each week during this same time and discover the power of prophecy. 